Hello? Can you hear me all right? All right. There I was, hiding in my bedroom closet, ashamed of what I had done. I didn't want to show my face, ever. I had called the home of a family friend and left a message on their answering machine saying some not very nice things about my big brothers. And my dad had overheard me on the phone. I just knew he would be so disappointed in me. I wallowed in my misery in that dark closet. Eventually, I heard someone calling my name. I can't remember if an older sibling coaxed me out or my dad hollered up the stairs for me, but eventually I emerged from my hiding place. I knew who I was. I was daddy's little girl, and certainly he would still love me. I could show him my face. Ashamed, unforgivable, worthless. How about unlovable? Have you ever felt that way? Feelings like these usually make us want to cover our faces and hide. In fact, when I was looking for some different pictures uh, this week about people with the title worthless, uh, a lot of them showed up with people with their hands over their faces. Today we'd like to remember, and we'd like to share a little bit with you about our story. Our story. And how God called us first to himself and then to each other. And we'd like to ask you today to think about how, if, or when God had called you and how you responded. But before we get into our story, would you please bow your heads with us as we pray? Lord, you know exactly who is here today. You know which parts of our story will impact each heart in whatever way is needed most. You know who is feeling they are not quite good enough for you. We know that we all struggle with feeling unloved at times. We know that those are, there are those here today, Lord, who are seeking your face and trying to figure out how to have a relationship with you. We are seeking your face today, Lord, and we trust that you will show up like you have done over and over again in the past. Thank you for never leaving us or forsaking us. Amen. Amen. So I'll just give a, a precursor here that we may interrupt each other <laughs> because we might need to correct some things or add some details. But um, I'll, I'll start off with my prayer. I had believed for so long that my value was found in being worthy of a guy's attention. I was on the edge of 18 and still didn't have a boyfriend. God had been strongly convincing me that I needed to be happy in him. So after praying about it, I spilled my guts to one crush about how I sensed we weren't the right match and that as much as I liked him, I didn't want to pursue a relationship with him. I still wasn't content. A month or two went by and I was daydreaming about another guy, not Tom, who did seem to be the right match. God kept reminding me, that I needed to learn to be content being single. But I was struggling with big emotions, a feeling unloved that ran so deep. Lots of other teenagers had a significant other. What was wrong with me? I prayed night after night that God would help me to be happy without a boyfriend. I sensed that God wanted me to find my value and worth in my relationship with him. So I kept praying, night after night, at the end of that month, looking out the window one balmy spring night, I heard God speak. You need to pray about Tom Stone as your future spouse. What? Did I hear that right? I thought I was supposed to pray about being a happy singleton. Now what? So reluctantly and with great curiosity, I started praying about Tom. So I knew none of this. Charity and I had been friends for two years, maybe? Probably. When we met, she was 15. I was 19. 20. No romantic attraction. She was way too young, or <laughs> I was way too old. Both were true. But I had started my own journey through learning. The Lord was teaching me, too, to be happy being single. I'd done many things with many girls that I should have never done 
and I regret it to this day. But when I had made the decision not to, not to look for a girlfriend simply for the sake of self-gratification, I'd come to realize that I can be happy in God and he would lead me at just the right time. Just like our scripture reading said this morning, where God said in verse 8 of Psalm 27, when you said, seek my face, my heart said to you, your face, Lord, I will seek. Or as Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. But as I was content being single, and after Charity started praying, which I knew nothing about, people started approaching me, different people, independently, saying things like, you know that girl, she likes you, or you two would make a great couple. Even my dad got in on it. Now, I don't know, some of you might have heard about my friend Sky. There he is right there. That's a real recent picture of him. He was one of them. And he had said to me, oh, that charity girl, she likes you. And I said, no, she doesn't like me. We're just friends. And then my dad got in on it, saying things like, boy, that charity girl, she sure is pretty, isn't she? You notice how she prays about everything? Boy, she's a great singer. And so I kind of got it through my head, finally, in my thick head, that maybe I should start praying about her, not knowing that she was praying about me and had been for a number of months. I had learned not to move ahead of God, and I'm still learning that today. Just like Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 tells us. Maybe we could say this together. Are we familiar with this verse? Trust, Trust in, in the Lord, Lord with, with all, all your, your heart. heart. And lean not unto your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. So what are all of your ways? Certainly a uh, wife or husband would be one of those ways, don't you think? Maybe important decisions about where you're going to college, or going to college or what your next job might be or where you might move. But how about the little things like... Should I go grocery shopping today? Should I buy broccoli or a cauliflower? Are those your ways too? God is, in, is calling us to seek his face in everything that we do. So certainly in this big decision, it made sense to seek his face. And so I did. And I put out a fleece before the Lord. I asked him to open and close doors. I said, Lord, you know, Charity lives all the way over in Wenatchee because I lived on the coast. That's so far away. But if you see fit that I should at least approach her and let her know that I like her, which certainly I did, but romance was growing in me. If you think that it's the right thing, send her from all the way over there, over the mountains, to where I live at Mission Creek School in Willapa Harbor. So I prayed I invited my dad to join me because obviously he was already on board. And so, I waited for the Lord to answer. So did I come to Mission Creek that year? Well, no, you didn't. And I wasn't perhaps ready. Maybe you weren't ready. The Lord knew. But in the meantime, my friend Sky, who I just showed you a picture of, he and I thought it'd be neat to go to Indonesia. I don't know why Indonesia. I mean, we were single. We were, uh, you know, we had time. It was Christmas break coming up. 2004, and we said, uh, hey, let's go. So we didn't go onto Google, because it was 2004. We went to the library, and we found some uh, videos uh, we rented from the library that we could watch about Indonesia, looked in the maps, and uh, you know, thought about how we might be able to get airplane tickets and had to get passports. And with all this stuff, there was one thing I knew I needed to do, and that was to trust in the Lord. So... Just like I started praying about charity, I started praying about that. Asking, Lord, please open and close doors. May your will be done. Sadly for us, I mean, me and my friend Sky, we didn't go. But happily for us, me and charity, I went to see her instead on Christmas break. And I remember driving over to, to uh, Kashmir, where she lives, and I lived and lives, and, uh, and just on the way, 
thinking about what my dad had told me right before we left. Son, you better snatch her up. You better get a hold of her right away because she's one in a million. Some other guy's going to come along and get her. But I had already made an agreement with the Lord. I had said, Lord, I'm not going to tell her anything about any of my thoughts or feelings about her until you make it very clear. And remember what my fleece was. Lord, send her to Mission Creek. You know, Deuteronomy tells us this. It says, when you make a vow to the Lord, your God, you shall not delay to pay it. And when I read that as a young man, I thought to myself, if I tell the Lord I'm going to do something or I'm not going to do something, I better stick with it. For the Lord your God will surely require it of you, and it shall be sin to you. So I thought in my mind, even though, you know, the fifth commandment, right? Honor your father and your mother. I said, well, I already made an agreement with the Lord, Dad. I can't go back on it. I can't say anything. And so I went there. I spent time with charity. We uh, had a good time just visiting as friends. We hadn't talked about any of this, but she liked me, and I liked her, and it wasn't too awkward, was it? Nah. But something else happened that same Christmas break when I had come over here from the coast, when the door shut for me to go to Indonesia. And we call it today the Boxing Day Tsunami. Who knows that I wouldn't have been right there on that day. But the Lord closed the door. Because of that tsunami, that place and other places were devastated. And when I found that out, I don't know if I must have heard it on the radio, right when I was here in, uh, in the Wenatchee area, I was blown away by the love of God and how he had closed doors. You know, sometimes you want something in your life and you think it's a good thing, but God knows better than you do. He sees more than you do. He understands more than you do. He wants more for you than you want for yourself. And so when he says no, you can say, oh, thank you. Thank you for saving me from whatever that thing was. Because mostly when he says no, he says no, but I've got something better for you. Mm. Isaiah tells us plainly, remember the former things of old. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and there is none like me. Declaring the end from where? From the beginning. And from ancient times, the things that are not yet done. God knows all these things. So I wonder this morning, how about you? Would you like protection in your life from somebody who knows more than you do? Can do more than you can do? Would you like to have prosperity in your life? I'm not talking about earthly prosperity. Yeah, that might come too. We read in 1 John, John says, but it's the word of the Lord, my great desire for you is that you prosper and be of health even as your souls prosper. If you want that in your life, do what we read in Psalm 27. Seek his face. He's taking the initiative. He's calling out to you. Seek my face. And it's only for your good. But sometimes when we seek his face, we have to wait. Don't we, darling? So I was crushed because here this guy drove all the way over from the coast, and he didn't say anything about liking me at all. So this is the part of the story where, in my humble opinion, Tom was supposed to ask me to be his girlfriend. That lingering sense of needing to find my worth in a boyfriend hadn't gone away. By this time, I'd been praying about Tom specifically as my future husband for a year and a half. It's a really long time for a teenager. <laughs> it's a really long time for anybody. Um, so sometimes we don't like to share the parts of our story that are messy. We like to skip over them and pretend that everything worked out with a hitch, uh, without a hitch. See, like we're hitched. Everything worked out without a hitch, right? Uh, but that wasn't the case. I fell into a pretty deep depression after Tom's Christmas visit. I questioned if God was even real. Why would he tell me to pray about Tom as my future husband for the last year and a half and have absolutely nothing come of it? Was I delusional? Had I actually heard God? So I stopped praying about Tom, and I just stopped praying, period. In my view, if there was a God, he had turned his face from me. So I turned my face from him. 
I sought my worth in being the newspaper editor of Wenatchee Valley College's recently revived periodical. And although I knew better, I caved under the persistent pressure from a guy friend to smoke pot and try drinking with him. I spent more and more time in an increasingly codependent mess with this person. I found that alcohol allowed me to feel differently about myself, and I craved that experience. As my graduation from community college approached, I got a call from Pastor Tara one day. Pastor Tara had mentored me, discipled me, and baptized me just two summers before. She wondered if I would be willing to come and spend a third summer working door-to-door -door as an evangelist with the Western Washington Youth Challenge Program. If you only knew what I have been up to, I thought. I tried several different excuses, feeling very unworthy, but then I was surprised to hear the words coming out of my mouth. I'll pray about it. The moment I heard myself say those words, I knew that there was no going back on them. I would be joining this Christian gang of do-gooders for the summer, whether I liked it or not. I arrived a day late due to my graduation and was told that a special service of laying on of hands had been done the night before and would now be done for me. As hands were laid on me and I was prayed over, I saw my life make a complete 180 degree turnaround. I was God's girl. I started praying again and seeking after God's will for my life. Within a couple of weeks, I realized that I probably should be praying about Tom as my future husband, too. Was there still a possibility? During this time, I knew a little bit about what was going on, thanks to this lady in the pink right here, Doreen, Charity's mom. Because apparently my dad and Charity's mom had been talking with each other. I don't know if it was a camp meeting or what, but they both liked the idea of us being together. And if I might just take one little moment to pause in our story here and just speak to the young people. You know, if you're not thinking about a wife yet, like my son, he's only eight, or a husband yet, like my daughter, she's only seven, still keep this in mind. And teens out there, think about this. Just like God knows more than you know and can do more than you can do and loves you more and wants more for you than you want for yourself, your parents love you too. They know more. They've been more experienced than you. They've had... Uh, that more, more wisdom than you have. And it's important to consider what your parents have to say and to lean on them. We read in the New Testament, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. And it may not be according to the custom of our society today for arranged marriages, but I want to tell you something. God arranged our marriage, and I recommend it. So, it was time, finally time for camp meeting again, right? Mm -hmm. We had met at camp meeting, matter of fact, years before at this point. But we got to camp meeting, and I was really curious about something when I saw Charity again. Do you remember what my fleece was? Lord, if it's right for me to tell her that I like her, send her to Mission Creek. It had been a year and a half since the time that you were disappointed, and she still hadn't come, I wanted to know if she was still interested in coming. So when I saw her at camp meeting, as nonchalantly as I possibly could, when I saw her and the time was right, I just said, so, have you put, I, I know you mentioned about maybe coming to Mission Creek. Do uh, you think that that might be something you'd be doing or something like that? And uh, what was your reply? So that was like the furthest thing from my mind, and it was very nonchalant. I had no idea what this guy was thinking or what his prayers had been. Um, the year before, I had not gone to Mission Creek because I knew that I liked him, and I needed to let things cool off so that if I was going out there, I would be going out there to work for God and going out there for the right reasons. So when I, told, when I saw Tom at camp meeting, I told him that I hadn't really thought about it, but that I would pray about it. Uh, Mission Creek was the last place on my list. And you'll notice this, a theme here, you know, I haven't really thought about that. I don't really want to do that. I'll pray about it. So for me, that was my way of seeking God's face and will about things and his way of changing my heart on matters. 
So as I said, Mission Creek was the last place on my list. I was thinking about going to study at Walla Walla. Um, I was thinking about going to follow this guy that I was still carrying a torch for wherever he went to college, or maybe just getting a job picking summers all cherry, or like, or picking cherries all summer long. <laughs> um, anyone, anything but volunteering alongside Tom, because I knew that he didn't like me. That's what I was convinced of. And um, so, yeah, no way. Plus, I wasn't going to be getting paid if I went out there. So, um, anyway, I told Tom that I would pray about it, and I went back to Sunset Lake Camp where the Youth Challenge group was staying for the weekend. Uh, God promises in Deuteronomy 4.29 that you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. So I had that experience in my time with God where I prayed about the next steps that he would have me to take. And he reminded me that I had not really been that happy making decisions on my own that only served myself. I was happiest when I was serving him. So at that moment, I decided to choose the only option on my list that would put me in an environment where I was serving God. I decided to volunteer at Mission Creek. I determined to tell the principal of the school the next time I saw her. On my walk over to tell the principal that I would indeed work there that school year, I bumped into my mom. Tom likes you, she told me. His parents like me, I replied. No, she argued, he likes you. Apparently, she had been talking to Tom's dad. I still wasn't sure if our parents were trying to arrange something between us or if there was a chance that Tom himself actually did like me, since he didn't make it very clear at his Christmas visit. I was a little terrified at this point. I had already told God that I would go work at Mission Creek. I wasn't going to turn back now. I was seeking God's face, and this is where he was leading me. So could Tom still be a part of his plan for my life? So when I heard the news, I was totally excited. The principal and her husband knew by now. Both of my parents knew. Some of the youth group had uh, all known because I asked them, invited them to join me in praying about this. But keep it secret because it's got to be in God's time, I was telling everybody. Of course, my dad apparently didn't keep it quite secret. Or Doreen, but she wasn't in on it too much. I think she just heard from my dad. But anyway, finally Charity came to Mission Creek, and I was looking forward to finally letting her know that I liked her. I had surrendered. Charity had come to the place of surrender. We had sought God's face. We'd sought him first and his righteousness and his kingdom and set ourselves aside, coming to the point of believing that God knew what was best for us. He wanted what was best for us, and he could give us what was best for us if we just sought his face and waited upon him. And now, it looked like it was going to happen. So, she arrived, and uh, I had already arranged something with uh, the principal of the school. It was still summertime, but the schedule was still very busy, and, and I said, hey, I'd like to take Charity for a drive, and I've got this great place. I don't know how I found it, but it's probably like 20 minutes away or more, uh, probably more like 40 minutes away. Anyway, it was a long ways away from where we were, but it was a cliff overlooking the bay, and it was just a really nice place. But it had to be, you know, Western Washington's not always sunny and beautiful like it is here. It had to be the right day, the right time. Everything had to be right. So when the time was right, I was going to take her out to this cliff. I was going to push her out. No, no, no. I mean, I was going to take her out over this cliff. I was going to, you know, romantically tell her. So two weeks passed. We were selling fruit. We were picking blackberries. We were doing all sorts of different things. And finally, it was the Sabbath. Who's thankful for a day of rest? <laughs> Amen. It was the Sabbath, and guess who was preaching that day? What were you preaching about, honey? I was preaching about wisdom and patience. Why patience? Because that was the topic. <laughs> When we got out of the sermon that day, and I had kind of rounded the corner outside the church, and some of the other youth were there, uh, one of them said, hey, man, have you asked Charity, or you told Charity you liked her, or asked her out, or whatever? And I said, be quiet, man, she's right around the corner. She doesn't know yet. Well, you know, when they start talking about patience, they're probably getting impatient. We had an outdoor potluck that day, which we're going to be having soon here in our church. And uh, it was over at uh, a family's house, and they had a big yard, and it was a 
you know, just a nice view. So we all traveled over to this house. We were all eating lunch there. And one of the fellas, I believe it was Mark, one of the fellas that had said, hey, that girl likes you. I'm trying to remember who it was. But anyway, said, man, isn't it a beautiful day today? Just while we were eating our lunch. Isn't it a beautiful day today? I said, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful day today. You know, because I needed the right day, right? And it's the Sabbath. We're not going to be selling fruit today. So, you know what I did with my plate of food? And I went over to Charity, and she was sitting down eating, and I said, hey, would you like to go for a ride? And she did a double take, and maybe you can tell them why. She goes, yeah, sure. Oh, I'd love to. Why, Why was that? So the way that my parents had started dating was my dad asked my mom if he wanted to go for a drive with her. So when Tom said at first, do you want to go for a drive with me? I was like, sure. And then I was like, sure, yeah, <laughs> let's go on this drive. So by this, by this point, there was a really weird dynamic between us because she knew I liked her and I knew that she liked me. And I knew that she knew, thank you, Doreen, that I liked her. And she knew that I knew that I liked her, or however that's said. Anyway. But we weren't talking about but it. But we weren't talking about it. Nobody's, you know, we hadn't said anything to each other. So she finished her meal, and we got my little pickup truck, and we started to drive. And boy, that was quite a drive, wasn't it? Quite awkward. Because what do you talk about? You know what you're going to talk about when you get there. But it was such a long drive, such a beautiful day. So we had some chit-chat best we could and just enjoyed the ride and finally got to the place. And we walked out this little path, lots of evergreens tall around us. And we get to the edge of this cliff, and it was so beautiful. And just forgive me if just for a minute I relive it because it was one of the best times of my life. And I knew it was going to be because God put me in that position. And he put her in that position Come stand with me, right? <laughs> right like we were. Oh, my goodness. I don't goodness. think we're holding hands yet. <laughs> no, we weren't. We were overlooking the bay, Philippa Harbor, and uh, the boats were out there fishing, and the breeze was coming in off the ocean, coming up the cliff right into our faces, just real gentle. The birds were flying in the sky. The sun was beaming down. And I just stopped, just like I'm going to do right now. I just stopped, and I just said to myself, God brought me here. And I don't know if you've ever had that experience, but friends, I want to tell you, you want to have that experience. When you're in a position, especially a nice, pleasant one like this, but when you're in a position where you can say, God has brought me here, You think about Joseph in prison. You think about Daniel in Babylon. You think about people in not so pleasant situations. And perhaps those are the times you really want to be able to say, God has brought me here. Because when things are going great, we can celebrate in our hearts, can't we? Mm -hmm. And we can praise and we can thank, can't we? You think about Job scraping himself with a broken piece of pottery and he still worshiped the Lord. When we seek the Lord with all of our hearts, when we seek his face, no matter what's happening around us, our hearts are focused upwards and we can know we've sought him the whole time, that he has brought us to that place. And he's not done with us yet. Amen? Amen. He's got more places to bring us, and certainly he brought brought me and Charity together. And there we were sitting. I just had my eyes closed, and I got up enough mustard to finally let her know, well, I've been praying, and I like you. It's probably a little bit better than this, but I like you, and I'd ask God if If it was right for me to ask you to court me for marriage, I didn't mean to say the M word right away, but I did anyway, uh, that, um, that he'd bring you to Mission Creek and, well, here you are. And 
I, I wonder if you, would, if you would be interested in doing that. Already probably knowing her answer. But I looked over at her kind of like this. And she had a big smile on her face. And after I told her she, that I'd been praying, what did you say? And I've been praying too. <laughs> that sealed it for me. Not only had God brought her to Mission Creek, but I knew that she was a woman who was seeking after God's heart. That she was seeking him first and his righteousness. And I didn't know it then, but what was your fleece, if you will? What was your like kind of prerequisite to the Lord for this thing? Like, Lord, I, there's certain things I want to have, I need. What was your thing? So I knew that Tom had had a lot of different girlfriends before and um, that, you know, he wasn't proud of the way that those things had gone. And I had never had a boyfriend before. And I didn't want to be just another girlfriend. Um, I wanted to, you know, I, I imagined that God probably didn't have me praying for over a year and a half for somebody just to casually date them. Um, so... And when we got there to Mission Creek, it was sort of weird because everybody had been praying that I would come over there because they knew that Tom liked me, like everybody except for me. And so people were already kind of treating us like a couple. And like here two weeks have gone by and he hasn't asked me to date him. And I'm like, well, just because I moved here doesn't mean I'm his girlfriend. Like we got to clear this up at some point. So, but I was also basking in it, you know. <laughs> so I... I specifically was asking God that when the time came that he would show me that Tom was serious about the relationship. And he did that, even if it was just like a slip of the tongue. I don't know. It was but a finely ordered prayer. slip of the tongue, I think. <laughs> I don't know, who, who, you know, who knows somebody and says, hey, you want to go on a date? And they end up saying marriage. But uh, that was definitely the Lord's design, wasn't it? And so, of course, she said Yes. And the rest is history. There's a picture of us there. But that's just a little bit of us remembering what God has done for us. We're wondering today, what has God done for you? Not that you would share it with us at this moment, but think about how God has led you. And I'm wondering, do you want to be led more? Do you want to be led closer? Do you want to be led faithfully by him? And he's given this invitation to seek his face. As Charity had mentioned, through prayer, certainly seeking him through his word. And like Jesus said about his, his service, he said, of myself, I can do nothing. Only what I see the Father doing, that's what I do. So joining God in what he's doing, getting to know him better. This morning, we'd like to make a call. I, I, we haven't been here long. I don't know, uh, you know how much this happens here, but We'd like to ask you to respond because the scripture that we read this morning in our scripture reading is a response to God's call. Not only did he call the psalmist David to seek his face, but he calls you to seek his face. I wonder if you've been hearing God taking the initiative and calling you to seek him to set aside the distractions of this life and to put him first. Oh, I know one for me is sleep. I love sleep, but God says, love me more. Seek my face. I wonder if you've been, been hearing him call you to seek him. Now's the time. So we're wondering this morning, just by a raise of hand even, maybe somebody out there has been hearing God calling you to seek him. Has anybody been hearing God call you? Yeah. I want to encourage you to do as he says and seek his face. Charity and I are going to sing a song this morning, and we'd like to invite anybody who's, is, who's interested to make a commitment to God. This isn't for us or anybody else here, but to make a commitment to God by standing to say, Lord, I will seek your face. And by his grace, it'll happen. So let us sing together. Charity and I will sing. And you can just talk to him as he speaks to your heart and you respond.
that on each heart today that you are calling us. I ask you, Lord, for those who've made a commitment today, saying, yes, I will seek your face. You know how, fo- how far we short, uh, how short we fall of your glory. I ask you to work in us now to will and to do according to your good pleasure, to seek you with all of our heart, with all of our strength, with all of our soul, and that we will find you deeper and deeper and deeper in Jesus' name. this time you may be seated. We'd like to invite up our singers to have our, our closing song, and then Charity and I will return.